Look here, somebody's left me candy up here. That's nice. I'll tell you what, I want to refrain from eating it while I'm up here, you know, because I don't want you to... I don't know, I maybe should have hid those because some of y'all be looking at that candy like, I wonder if I can get up there and get one of those. Thank you. I like this a lot. This morning we'll be in Matthew chapter 27. For just the 12th time since 1714, Easter Sunday and April Fool's have fallen on the same day. As soon as I realized that this was going to be April Fool's, I thought this would be a perfect time to preach a special kind of message. And since it will be 11 years till this happens again, I said, Lord, what do you want me to have? And he gave me a title months ago. And so this morning I'm going to preach on Don't Be Fooled This Easter. Don't Be Fooled This Easter. Matthew 12, after 27, verse 15 says, Now at that feast, the governors want to release unto the people a prisoner whom they would. And they had them a notable prisoner named Barabbas. Therefore, when they had, were gathered together, Pilate said to them, whom, will ye release, whom would ye that I release unto you, Barabbas or Jesus, which is called Christ? For he knew that for envy they had delivered him. And when he was set down on the judgment seat, his wife sent unto him, saying, Have thou nothing to do with this just man? For I have suffered many things this day in a dream because of him. But the chief priests and elders persuaded the multitude that they should ask for Barabbas and destroy Jesus. And the governor answered and said to them, Whether the twain will ye that I release unto you? And they said, Barabbas. And Pilate said to them, What shall I do then with Jesus, who is called the Christ? And they all said unto him, Let him be crucified. And the governor said, Why? What evil hath he done? But they cried out the more, saying, Let him be crucified. And when Pilate saw that he could prevail nothing, but for rather a tremulant was made, he took water and washed his hands before the multitude, saying, I am innocent of the blood of this just person. See ye to it. Then answered all the people and said, His blood be on us and our children. Then released he Barabbas unto them. And when he had scourged Jesus, he delivered him to be crucified. And I want to stop right there. It takes us back a little bit before what we celebrate today. This morning we're going to look at the life of Pontius Pilate, the governor, and how that Jesus and him are intertwined here in this Story, How that Pontius Pilate is given the opportunity to decide whether or not Jesus is innocent or guilty. To decide ultimately whether Jesus is really who he says he is because that's what he was tried for. You understand this morning that Jesus did not die because of anything other than the fact that he said, I am God, I am the Messiah. And that's why they put him to death. Right. He died for our sins, but the crime that they would put him out there was for is that he said he was God. And so Pontius Pilate, in essence, is determining the truth of this statement. And so as we go through this, he's finding all these different ways to possibly let Jesus go by beating him, by doing all this other stuff. And yet the people are adamant, Jesus is going to die. Crucify him. Crucify him, right? We put him on the cross on Friday, and as he laid down his life, he died. He took all the sins of the world upon us. And this is where we pick up this morning in chapter 27, verse 65. He's dead. They put his body, Joseph of Arimathea, has taken and put him in a grave. And it says this, 27, 65, And Pilate said unto them, they've come to him, they said, We want some guards, we want some soldiers. Ye have a watch. Go your way and make it as sure. As you can. So they went and they made the sepulchre sure, sealing the stone and setting a watch. We turn over to 28, verse 1. And at the end of the Sabbath, as it began to dawn toward the first day of the week, came Mary Magdalene and the other Mary to see the sepulchre. And behold, there was a great earthquake, for the angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone from the door and sat upon it. And his countenance was like lightning, and his raiment white as snow. And for fear of him, the keepers did shake and became as dead men. And the angel answered and said to the woman, Fear not ye, for I know that ye seek Jesus which was crucified. He is not here, for he is risen. As he said, come and see the place where the Lord lay. This morning I want to talk about how Pilate was fooled and what we need to avoid to keep from being fooled like him. 
I think the first thing we find in this passage of Scripture is Paul was fooled into thinking that he would not have to make a decision on this. As we read this Scripture, we find the one thing Pilate didn't want to do is he didn't want to be the one to pass judgment on Jesus. How many people out there today are looking for a way to escape passing that judgment? And you say, Pastor, what do you mean by passing judgment? I mean by determining what you believe and who you believe Jesus was. See, we, all of us in here in this room, everybody in this world has at one point or another in our life got to make a decision for ourselves. Who is Jesus? Pontius Pilate is placed before Jesus and he's looking at Jesus and they're saying, what do you think about him? Is he an enemy of Caesar? Is he an imposter? Is he this blasphemer that we're claiming to be? And Pilate says, I really don't want to make that decision. So what did he do? He beat him. He berated him. He questioned him. He tried him. And when he couldn't find a problem, verse 4 and 17 says, Therefore, when they gathered together, Pilate said to them, Whom will ye that I release unto you, Barabbas, or Jesus, which is the Christ? When he could not find a problem, when he couldn't find a way that he could, in his mind, justify that this man needed to die at all, he says, I'm going to turn it back over to the crowd. Because I don't want to make this decision today. Maybe we can sit here in this church service. Maybe we can sit in the world and we can let everyone else say what they want to say. And we think we can hide and keep ourselves quiet today and think, I don't have to make that decision. It did not work for Paul and it will not work for us. We cannot have a religion or a relationship or any other thing with Jesus based on someone else. It has to be based on ourselves. It does not matter what your mom thinks, what your dad thinks, what your husband thinks, what your wife thinks, what your children thinks. What matters today is what you think. Pontius Pilate's wife comes up to him and says, I don't want you to have anything to do with this man. I'm having terrible dreams. Get out of this thing. Don't do what's wrong, Pilate. And yet, the overwhelming crowd was saying, crucify him. The overwhelming opinion was this man must die. And Pilate said, I can't let that go. I'm going to have to make a decision based on what's best for me today. Sometimes we make decisions what we think is best for us, but it's not the best, is it? Have you ever made a decision that you thought was best for you and afterwards you said this was not the best decision? Now today, when you leave this place, you may go eat dinner somewhere. And the best decision, you may want to have a Conley Lee dessert plate. Right, Leora? <laughs> Conley, Conley looks like he weighs about 125 soaking wet. And he had about 50 pounds of desserts that one day we went to the Golden Corral. And I don't know, I don't know what he felt like afterwards, but I, I tried to copy him. Because I, I try to follow, you know, elders in the church, I try to follow their lead. And... Uh, I saw Conley with that big dessert plate and I didn't feel so bad getting me a big dessert plate. But that probably wasn't the best idea for me, you know. Conley still weighs 125 and I've went and, uh... Pilate says, I'm going to do what everybody else is saying. Crucify him. I, I will allow them to have their way. I think he thought this morning that it wasn't his fault. Maybe this morning as we're sitting here, we can look at a lot of people in our life and we can look at a lot of people in this world. And we say, why did Jesus have to die? We had to die for the sins of the world. We know that. And yet when we start talking about the sins of the world, oftentimes we think about the worst people with the worst sins. Right? We think about the people that are in prison, the people that are in death row, those people that have committed unquestionable acts of violence or hurt. And yet the Bible says that for all have sinned. For all have sinned. That means no matter how I want to put around, I'm part of the guilty group. That no matter how much I want to look over at somebody else and say, well, it was them. I got to say it was me too. That I had something to do with his death. That each and every one of us this morning had something to do with his death. That sin that he died for was not his. It was mine. And it was yours. Until we understand that, until we get to the point where we recognize that Jesus died for me. And when I say Jesus died for me, 
I'm talking about every single person in this world. Jesus died for you. Until I understand that that's why he came for it, it's not going to do anything to me. It's not going to do anything for me. I'm just fooling myself. The second thing I think this morning was Pilate was fooled into thinking he could wash his hands and be clean. You know, sometimes we get like Pilate and we start seeing something bad happen and we get a little bit guilty. You know, even when we feel like we're doing good, sometimes you feel a little guilty. After I even started eating those desserts, Lior, I, I started feeling a little bit guilty. Not enough to stop eating them, but you know, I, I was a little bit guilty. Because in Pilate's mind, he knew what he wanted to do. I think in Pilate's mind, he thought, you know, I, I don't really think this guy's done anything to warrant this death. I think I just let him go, but the crowds were saying crucify him. Everybody else was saying that he needs to die. People have a tendency to just go along with the flow of things. We kind of talked about it last week with Palm Sunday when they said Hosanna. And now we see it again where they're saying Crucify him. Crucify him. Do you think all the people really knew why they were saying that? Or is it just because so many were loud saying it? You know, it's easy to act like a Christian when you're around Christians. It's harder when you're not. It's harder to stand up for Jesus when you're not around people that believe in Jesus. It'll be harder when you leave this place than it is today. Today we can sing up from the grave he arose. Now what about tomorrow and the next day? Look at verse 24, what Pilate does here. When Pilate saw that he could not prevail nothing, but that rather a tumult was made, he took water and he washed his hands before the multitude, saying, I'm innocent of the blood of this just person. See you to it. No matter what Pilate could do, though, Pilate was still guilty. He decided he would take and he would wash his hands and say, I'm washing myself clean. It's not my fault. This is a just man. You have chosen today to crucify him. But what does the Bible say? It says, wherefore as by one man sin entered into the world and death passed upon all men for that all have sinned. That means each and every person in this world sinned. And when it gets down to it, I can't wash my hands and say, Jesus, I'm not responsible for your death. I got to take an ownership of that and say, I am responsible. We have a world today that says, well, sometimes I feel a little bit guilty. And you know what we do when we feel guilty? We try to make ourselves feel better. You start feeling guilty about what you have. What do you do? You make a donation. You're watching television. You start feeling guilty. You see that little orphan and you say, hey, listen, I can help out with that. You start seeing needs and you say, I start feeling guilty, I'll volunteer. Yeah. You're at school, they need somebody to help with your kids' stuff. You start feeling guilty or they make you feel guilty, and what do you do? Okay, I'll volunteer, I'll make a dozen cupcakes or I'll run the, the uh, party this week or I'll, I'll run concessions at soccer, right? Guilt has a way of making us feel like that and what we basically are doing is we wash our hands and say, I feel just a little less guilty than I did before. Pilate looks at the situation and says, I know this man is going to die. I know this man is a just man. I know that I shouldn't do this, but I've got to make everybody happy and I've got to do what everybody wants and I'm going to do this and so I'll wash my hands and I'll blame it on you and I'll blame it on you and I'll blame it on you and I'll be done with it. And so many times in our life we can do that. We can walk away from something because that is the end of it, Right? I served my time. I did my thing. I contributed. So now let somebody else deal with it. Pilate said, I can wash my hands and be clean. He's only fooling himself. And I want to say this morning, if we don't have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, then whatever we're doing by washing our hands, whether it's doing good deeds, whether it's attending church, whether it's being nice, whether it's giving to some organization, whether it's feeding the homeless, whatever that thing is, outside of a relationship with Jesus Christ won't matter. It won't get you to heaven. It won't have you a relationship with God the Father. Jesus says, I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life. And no man comes to the Father but by me. That's the reason he died, folks. 
If it didn't take his death, then he wouldn't have done it. If all it took was us coming to church, then he wouldn't have died. We'd have just came to church. If all it took is baptism, then he would have got baptized and we'd all been happy. But that's not what it took. The Bible says without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin. If you were here Good Friday, you know what happened. He laid down his life and the God said that is the price for sin. And when he laid down his life, when he shed his blood and he said it is finished. That was the beginning. This is the ending. Pilate said, I'm going to wash my hands and everything's going to be over. But this isn't over because this is Jesus. And death does not stop Jesus. Death does not end the story, does it? Death is just the beginning of the story because that is sin conquered. And now we get to the resurrection. Pilate was fooled and thinking this was the end. Let's look at chapter 27, verse 65 again. Crucifixion has happened. Jesus has died. They put him in Joseph of Arimathea's tombs. And they come to Jesus now, the Jewish leaders, and they say, we want you to help us keep this grave. Pilate said unto them, ye have a watch. Go your way and make it as sure as you can. So they went and they made the sepulcher sure, sealing the stone and setting a watch. Have you ever thought about this? On Friday, Jesus died. The Bible says all men forsook him. He is there at the cross. There are some women there that's crying, his mother, Mary Magdalene, and they're crying and they're watching this. You've got some disciples from afar. It seems like John's right there because he says, woman, behold thy son. But everybody else has run off. All his people. They've won, they think, Right? Pilate's washed his hands. It's all good. The Jewish leader says, we have killed him. And so all of a sudden, he's in this tomb. And they knew more, it seemed like, than the people that were following Jesus because they said, wait a second, he promised he was coming back. Right? He's promised he's coming back. Those disciples are going to come and steal his body. That's kind of weird because they couldn't stop the crucifixion. They didn't put up much of a fight. And now that he's dead, they're going to come out of hiding and take this body and do all this stuff. You know what I think? I think they were afraid he was coming back. So they go to Pilate. They say, Pilate, we need some help. He probably thought, I've already helped you. What do you want now? I put him to death. I pronounce him guilty. What do you want me to do now? We need you to put this big old stone in front of this tomb. We need you to seal that stone so they can't get it open. And we need you to put a bunch of soldiers. It says we want to make it sure. Right? What are we making sure? We're making sure that he ain't coming back. Philip? Right? There's no way possible that he's going to come out. Let's make sure. But you know something? The best you can make sure as a person that's no match for a God. So they did. They rolled a stone in front of the tomb. They sealed the door. They put a band of soldiers there to watch. You know what happened? On the first day of the week, right? Mary came unto the tomb of Jesus. The stone was moved and it had rolled away. The angel said, fear not, I know whom seek ye. For he is risen, this she heard him say. She said, gone, the stone is rolled back, gone. The tomb is empty, gone. To sit at the Father's side. And gone, over death triumphant, gone. Sin is defeated, gone. For he lives forevermore. You catch that? He came to the tomb. They said, where is he at? And they didn't have to worry about it because the Bible said the angel came down and he rolled the stone away. The power of the Lord is that the stone was rolled away and the seal they thought could keep him. It had no effect. It wasn't sealed very well. Because it went like that. And what about those soldiers, Pastor? What about all those tough soldiers, the ones that crucified him, the ones that said... If you be the son of God, right? 
the ones that spit at him, the ones that mocked him, the ones that took his clothes. The Bible said that an angel came down. It said they got so scared they became like dead men. Can you imagine the conversation? All right, man. We'll guard this tomb. Then disciples come, we're going to kill them on sight. There ain't no way they're getting Jesus out of this thing. Sir, what if he was to actually raise from the dead? Are you talking to me, son? You see that stone? You saw what he looked like when he died. He can't move that stone. Even if for some reason he's still alive in there, he ain't never getting out of this place. And guess what? We're here to make sure that happens. Yes, sir. Ha <laughs> ha, ain't coming back now. Saturday night. He ain't coming back yet. Uh oh, Sunday morning. <laughs> earthquake, right? Does that sound like an earthquake when the angel came down? Yep. That stone moved back. Sir, I think something. So I know it's saying. Uh, I think maybe something happened. And, uh, <laughs> oh my goodness. Here comes the Marys. Seems like the soldiers had fallen dead and rolled away or something themselves. You know, maybe that's the next verse. The soldiers rolled away from the tomb of Jesus. They were scared and they could not get away too fast. They rolled away. They got away. They was gone. The Marys came there and the angels, the only one they see. And they look and they see the tomb is empty and they're scared. And they say, for not who you seek is not here. He has risen just as he said. What about that? If you're going to worship somebody, you want to worship somebody that does what they say. You want to worship somebody that's got the power. This morning, we're not sitting here because our Savior's dead. We're not standing here because he could not come back to life, because he could not remove the stone, because he could not break the seal, because he could not stop the armed guards. We are standing here today because he did exactly what he said. He wasn't there. He was risen. Amen. We, today, need to serve that risen Savior. The second verse of that song basically says, my friend, if you don't know my risen Savior, I beg of you, don't wait too late to pray. Don't wait until his bride has been completed. Don't wait until you hear him say, too late. We don't want to wait. This is Easter Sunday. Easter Sunday, this is the day we're celebrating a risen Savior. But who is he to you? This is also April Fool's. Pontius Pilate was fooled into thinking he didn't have to make a choice. Pontius Pilate was fooled into thinking he could wash his hands and be all right. Pontius Pilate was fooled into thinking when Jesus was dead, that was the end of it. Let's not be fooled like that today. Let's recognize that he's alive. And because he lives, I can face tomorrow. As every head is bowed and every eye is closed this morning, I want to ask you one simple question. It's this question right here. If you were to die right now, I'm not asking you if you're an old person, if you're a middle-aged person, if you're a young person. I'm just asking you if you're a person. The Bible says that we all die. It is a point in the man once on after that, the judgment. We all know that death comes. We don't know when it comes. We don't know what day it comes. We just know it will come. So my question this morning is this. If you were to die this morning, if you were to die this week, if something were to happen to you and you left this world, where would you spend eternity at? Maybe that's a question we don't think about very often. Because we're living our life to its fullness and we don't think about death, but death is no respecter of persons. 
And maybe this morning as I'm asking that question, in your mind you're saying, you know what, either three answers. One is, I know I'd be in heaven because I've accepted Jesus as my Savior. Two is, I have no idea whatsoever. And three is, Pastor, to be honest with you, I would probably not make it to heaven. I'd probably spend eternity in hell. That's the three answers. For the person that says, Pastor, I know for sure I'm on my way to heaven, I say, praise the Lord. For the person that says, I'm not sure, last week I had a lady walk up to me and said, tell me how I can know for sure. And I want to offer that to you just in a second. And for the first, third person says, I know for sure, I, I, I don't know Christ as my Savior. This morning, I'm not going to come and get you. I'm not going to try to embarrass you. I just want to pray for you. If you, would not, if you do not know for sure that you'd be on your way to heaven right now, and you say, Pastor, would you pray for me? Would you slip up your hand anywhere in this audience today? Pastor, I'm not 100% sure, but I'd love for you to pray for me so that before it's too late, I would. Anybody at all? Yes, I see your hand. Yes, I see your hand. Someone else? Yes, I see your hand. I'm not 100% sure. The Bible says these things are written that you may know that you have eternal life. For God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. You know what Jesus died on the cross for? He died on the cross so you and I could live. In just a moment, we're going to play a source of invitation, a song. And we're going to invite people to come down. They can come down and pray. They can come down here and say, Lord, you know what? I thank you for the cross of Calvary. I thank you that you rose on this Sunday. For those of you that's raised your hand and say, Pastor, I don't know. Would you come today and let me show you so you can leave this place as a new person, as God's person, as his child? Heavenly Father, we come to you this morning and we are thankful, Lord, that we celebrate Easter. We are thankful for what you did on the cross. And Lord, we have those today that have raised their hand and said, Pastor, I don't know for sure. Jesus, you've already done all the work. All we have to do is believe. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord, the Bible says, shall be saved. Not could, not can, not might, but shall. And Lord, for those that raise their hand today, I'm praying for them that they would walk this out today and receive you as their Savior. Lord, there may be others in this building right now that didn't raise their hand, but they're thinking the same thing. I don't really know. Holy Spirit, this can't be my invitation. This has to be yours. It can't be my words that talks to people. It has to be you speaking to them. And so, Lord, we pray that you would pour your Holy Spirit out of this place in such a way that we might hear what you have to say today and that it might prick our hearts and cause us to come to know you. Lord, speak to us right now. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you stand with us this morning?